In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Well, hello, Sublation Media viewers and listeners and readers. It's uh, this week's Sublation Magazine show with me, Douglas Lane. And me, Ashley Crowley. I'm excited about today's show. I'm stupidly excited because we're going to be uh, answering viewer mail, which makes me feel like I'm a television star. You know, David Letterman <laughs> back in the day used to answer viewer mail once a week. We should start doing this uh, every like once a month, uh, answering our viewer mail. Um, maybe we can read a top 10 list. Um, uh, we're also going to be discussing some of the articles we published rather than interviewing the authors are going to talk about them behind their backs. Um, <laughs> we we have uh, one that's called Only Class Struggle Can Save the Left. Then we have one on the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then um, this sort of uh, Pollyanna, optimistic, naive author wrote a book called The Future and How to Get There, uh, wrote an essay called The Future and How to Get There, and we'll be discussing her work uh, as well. So um, we'll look forward to that. Uh, before I let Ashley talk, I want to say um, if you like uh, this channel, if you like what we do, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, um, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Go buy Todd McGowan's Enjoyment Right and Left. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes and Nobles. You can buy it through our website. And we will be sending those books out. We've had a snag there. They're delayed a little, but we are going to get those books that were pre-ordered out. Um, also, consider supporting us on Patreon. Right now, the Patreon is the major source of revenue that we have as the books uh, slowly start to sell. So if you um, like us, uh, put some money where your your heart is, and uh, you can even sign up for an annual membership. Uh, you get a couple of months free that way. Um, and uh, I think you can drop a super chat if you would like to. Um, but uh, okay, so there, there's all that business out of the way. Ashley... Uh, well, what's on your mind this week? How are you doing? <laughs> um, well, I'm sick yet again, which is awesome. This is like the fourth time I've been sick. Um, uh, anybody who's got kids out there, they've started school. I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and my four-year-old just started school. So I have every plague going, which is awesome. Um, so I've been kind of stuck inside Um uh, half delirious, but I am really excited for some of the things that we've got coming up in Sublation. Um, we are going to be having some announcements in the coming weeks mm -hmm. regarding some interesting new directions that we'll be taking um, that will, I think, um, bring together a lot of the of what we've been doing and begin to foment revolution. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 at the very least, we'll start to rethink uh, the the trajectory of the socialist left. That's sort of going to be our aim. Um, I felt been feeling the doldrums, you know, uh, in the last I'd say the last two years has been kind of a downtime. Um, it's time to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and and move ahead. Yeah, and there are just so many, uh, there have been lots of questions that have um, really been bothering me and things that I've never really been able to figure out. Questions that really rose to my consciousness in 2008 as a result of the global financial crisis. And, um, you know, that, that's when I started seriously studying um, Marx and capital. And I want to, because I, I can feel now, I can see, we can all see it, that the current crisis, the crisis that's coming toward us, first of all, was denied. You know, no, no, there's no crisis. No, it's actually this. And, and then it was scapegoated. Oh, it's because of what's happening in Ukraine. You know, this everything would be fine if not for that. And now it's sort of minimized. A, a recession is coming. Yes, this is a normal thing. And it'll all be fine. Well, <laughs> meanwhile, everyone's actually losing their shit behind the scenes. Um, and so I really want to make sure that we get our heads around what's going on here, um, yeah. because that's the only way we're going to be able to get through it um, without the massive amounts of destruction. Well, <laughs> I don't even know if we'll be able to avoid the massive amounts of destruction, but we need to be prepared and we need to understand what's happening. So that's going to be, I hope, a, a really big part of some of the work that I'm going to do for simulation in the coming months. Yeah, um, I, I do think you're right that... Uh... This I mean, right before the midterms, 
um, the price of uh, gas fell a little bit in the United States and the rate of inflation slowed down a little bit. Um, but I think overall, even in the United States, we're looking at um, a massively disruptive couple of years uh, going forward. So um, we'll track the crisis and we'll try to make it as explicit as it was in 2008. One of the upsides of the 2008 crisis was that everyone, including uh, the uh, head of the Fed, um, yeah. uh, agreed that Alan Greenspan um, agreed that it was a crisis of capitalism. It was a, a, a crisis based on, you know, things were happening that they could not have or refused to think could happen. And um, so it was, uh, even in the mainstream, considered uh, a, a major shakeup. And uh, today, like you said, there's a concerted effort to sort of push the problem behind, you know, behind a curtain and to to talk about other things rather than capitalism itself um and that certainly is the case on the on the left um but they've known that this problem was coming that this this recession was coming since uh well <coughs> obviously people in the know know that um a, an enormous crisis was brewing but even people who were um relatively sort of not steeped in economics started to say uh oh things are going wrong in a real way in 2019 summer of 2019 um, so, you know, um, I'd like to kind of take that story back a little bit, because I think that in order to understand some of the response to COVID, we need to understand some of what was happening, um, within the economic sphere at that time. So anyway, mm -hmm. stay tuned mm -hmm. for all of that. <laughs> yeah. And pamphlets. We're going to be publishing pamphlets, um, which will become a reward for patrons as well as a, something you can, I think, just subscribe to on, on, on its own. Um, through our website, uh, we're we're going to work out all the price points. I have to get somebody who's good at math to come in and help me figure out how to how to uh, price these things. Um, but yeah, that is coming. Um, well, don't so get me to do it because fun fact: the only stats course I took as an undergraduate, I nearly failed. I failed the exam. I went outside and vomited in a bush. So <laughs> I'm not your girl. Well, well I, I, uh, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just I, laughing at my own joke. Damn it, Doug. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. And now he's completely just left me. Okay, well, until Doug comes back, <laughs> until Doug comes back, um, uh, there's been a theme over the past couple of weeks in Sublation Magazine, and it's basically climbing out of the mess of things um, that have tried and failed to replace class I, struggle over the past I, few years. I did not uh, mean to uh, drop out of the feed there. I don't know what happened. I don't know what button I pressed. Um, I don't think first you would make me laugh at my own joke alone. Did I leave? <laughs> you did. Like, it. Oh no no. <laughs> All right. Anyways, so, so we moved. We're moving on. We're moving forward. So um, the theme. There's been a kind of a theme in the magazine over the past few weeks, which is, as I was saying, um, climbing out of the mess of things that have attempted and failed, in my opinion, to replace class struggle as the defining motor of progress. You know, um, I wrote. I had an essay in the magazine about romanticism and psychology. Uh, the sort of romantic anti-capitalism was one a, a huge movement on the left for many, many years. And it's interesting because we kind of left that behind now in a lot of ways. And yet, it, and it's cropped up again on the right, which is actually its, um, its home. It's, that's where you would expect to see it. So we'll talk a little bit about that essay. Um, but first, we're going to look at an essay by Chris Wright called okay. Only Class Struggle Can Save the Left. Uh, and this is an essay that asks, um, well, why do we, well, it opens up by asking, why do we have so many problems on the left, so much internal internal struggle? Um, and uh, I wondered if, if, Doug, if you had any, I mean, this seems to be, I mean, this isn't the whole focus of the essay, but it was a question that kind of resonated with me. I wonder if you had any insights on why, you, why do you think leftists' own worst enemies are other leftists? I don't think it's actually the case. I think that oh, okay. the 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 or left is such a broad term. Socialists' own worst enemies are not other other socialists um, right now. It would be good if they were. It would be an improvement yeah. if our worst enemies were other socialists because that would mean we are engaging with socialism, and we could have mm. petty disputes. Well, I had in mind like socialists and communists in Spain, for example. You're supposed to be fighting the fascists, and you turn your guns on each other. 
Oh, right. Well, I mean, yeah, at that point, that is the case. But I'm right now, the debate between um, class and identity is not really a, de a debate between socialists and communists or left or left wing socialists and centrist socialists or something like that. It is a debate within the Democratic Party between the its left wing and its center. And um, and uh, that's, I think, what needs to be remembered. It, it, so one of the things that I wanted to bring up at the start was the title. Only class struggle can save the left. And the question is, does the left need saving? Um, what does it mean to try to save the left? Uh, are we thinking of the left as a, a project that is aiming at class struggle to change society fundamentally? Or are we, as Zizek often, often says, thinking of the left as part of a broad progressive coalition that's necessary um, so that the socialism can save capitalism um, is the left the left wing of capital and uh so are we trying to save the left in order to stave off the right to to save the center from fascist reaction um and i think often enough both things are meant at the same time or like the idea of radically changing society um is conflated with the idea of, of conquering the right um, and helping mm. the Democrats become a better party, perhaps something like that. Um, yeah, so, I, I see this all the time, the enemy, the enemy. And then you ask who's the enemy and they say the right. Right. Capital or. <laughs> right. It's yes, exactly. The enemy is the Republican Party. It's the Tories. It's whoever else is representing the most right wing uh, reactionary political faction within a society. And I, I'm not saying those people are our friends. I'm just saying, um, you know, the aim of socialism is to transform society overall. And that would include both wings of, or, you know, maybe abolish both wings of bourgeois politics. So um, that that would be my first observation is that uh, the essay, which, by the way, and I'm going to be criticizing um the, this essay only class struggle can save the left but i want to say like i'm very pleased that chris wright published it in sublation magazine and it, it raised many interesting issues and the and kind of did a retrospective i don't know if the if it was conceived of as a retrospective on the last let's say six years of maybe eight years of of left politics um eight years i would say when it, that yeah. started to become like a Mm -hmm. a huge movement so so i i will be defending this essay then because <laughs> <laughs> okay i really no. i really enjoyed it i i thought i i thought this is exactly the problem that we have or at least maybe not i, I feel like it's abated a little bit toward the present but mm -hmm. i think this is we've really been derailed by um identity um and it's it's like only the most recent in a long series of derailments. You know, you were we were derailed by anti-consumerism, by um, as I mentioned before, romantic anti-capitalism, on lifestyleism. This idea that your politics is really just to be lived out in your life. That was you know an enormous part of of um, you know organizing and so on. It was very very small scale for a long time, and then it became identity politics. I see these really as um, now. It doesn't mean that I don't think that these things, just as the essay says, um, I don't think these things are important. I do. I do. I think that there are issues that definitely do face particular groups, um, mm -hmm. and I have tried to draw attention to some of these issues myself. Um, but as, as the essay, as as Ray argues, um, you can imagine capitalism with everybody of the same race, for example but you cannot imagine capitalism, everyone, the same class. Um, yeah, the uh, I, I do think that if you enter into this debate between class and identity, it's pretty clear that the class side of the debate um, is a stronger side. I mean, um, the notion that capitalism is intrinsically racist or that white supremacy is constitutive of capitalism that's the key component is i think just on its face absurd um 
those who argue that it is seem to believe that if we can overcome, let's say, racist predatory lending or uh, inequality in wages or uh, taxation is another one mentioned in the article, uh, that at that moment, if we can, you know, no longer have, say, racist predatory lending, then um, then we will have uh, overthrown capitalism. Um, but this assumes that capitalism is just this corruption uh, mm -hmm. that's at work within some sectors of capitalism um, at some times. Uh, and I think it's a pretty thoroughly right-wing perspective to hold that capitalism itself could function properly if not for, you know, either the interference of the liberal state or uh, hmm. the racist reactionaries who are poisoning what would be perfectly operational market uh, forces. Exactly. Otherwise, um, it sounds like uh, my Trumpist friend, Stephen Janecki, who was recently on. Um, so... Yeah, and also it kind of um, it, it betrays this kind of faith in in the capitalist system that if only such and such could happen, everything would function smoothly, um, which really fails to realize that the concessions that we win from capitalism are at the expense of capitalism, and that's fine. <laughs> that's fine, you know. Like you, you when you demand higher wages. Um, that doesn't make capitalism function more smoothly. It makes progress function. It, it ensures that progress on many levels in terms of our living standards, in terms of um, even automation that, you know, when you force the capitalist to be progressive by automating your job out of existence. Well, that sounds really terrible, right? But you just raise the struggle when that happens. You, you know, that's part of the dynamism of this, of class struggle. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't do that. In fact, you're subsidizing the capitalist's inability to move beyond the present moment or, or a lack of desire to do that by accepting lower wages. Um, we should never accept that. And the, the empty, well, the threat to replace you with the machine, I mean, they would have done anyway if it was profitable. But the threat to replace you with a machine is, um, uh, is well, just let them do it because they're basically saying like, well, I'm not going to replace you with machines so long as I can get you to work for nothing, right? As long as I can make you work for peanuts, uh, and treat you like a slave, then that's that's fine. You know, you know, you don't accept that. You don't accept that, and you push for that. And yes, it does create problems. It does create, for instance, capital flight when you push for higher wages, and you just increase. You just push the struggle beyond that. You just keep going each and every time. But these things are not. They don't make capitalism function better. Capitalism can't be made to function in a harmonious way for both capitalists and workers. Um, this is one of the most basic kind of arguments of wage labor and capital. Which I always recommend to beginners <laughs> um, that um, the capitalists will always say, "Oh no, no! Look, I raise your living standards. Oh look, I'm I I give you a paycheck, and our interests are actually in harmony." And he keeps saying, um, "No, the interests of capital and labor are diametrically opposed. The more that the um, the you know the more the capitalist progresses relative to the." Uh, relative to the worker, the worker becomes relatively more immiserated. So as we, we yes, we do progress, yes, our living standards get higher, but even more so does the capitalist. And there's no such thing as a harmo as a harmony between these classes. So it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's just a lie <laughs> and we shouldn't buy into it. Well, I want to throw a question from the chat on the screen here. Um, Kara Rowe says, so the failures of the modern left are the result of internal problems rather than state forces tearing apart the left's many political movements since the 1950s. We could say, you know, many political movements since the 19th century. Um, uh, and what I would say is that, you know, Ashley, when you're talking about um, the contradiction between the struggle for better working conditions and uh, which might lead to innovation, creation of automation, uh, and the way in which that undermines the worker's own wages, possibly, or certainly uh, could create unemployment. Um, and you and and you suggest rightly that the workers simply have to organize to insist upon uh, the you know the holding on to higher wages and full employment. Say, you, then the question arises, and this is a question: internal ideology. What kinds of institutional backing what kinds of institutions 
what kinds of organizing would be necessary for the workers to have the actual power to insist. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, uh, would uh, being part of a, a trade union be enough? Would uh, uh, the rise of a massive array of trade unions be enough um, if they are isolated from one another? Do we need a political union movement? Um, do we need a party that is directing uh, the, the the strikes or the demands of the workers or, or helping to uh, provide the resources necessary for those demands which are coming from the rank and file to be held onto and maybe met? Um, so all of these internal problems around ideology also uh, are consequential when it comes to the ability to withstand the inevitable attacks from not just the state, but from the capitalist class broadly. Um, so I just want to say that. Yeah, I mean, the failures of the modern left are not only the result of internal problems, obviously. Um, there, there was a conscious, a very conscious attempt to crush um, any kind of working class organization, obviously, most famously in the 70s and 80s. Um, and we're kind of living in the in the ruins of that. We haven't really figured out how to organize. You know, unions, I mean, we can talk about the trade union movement with some hope and that there has been a, a lot of activity in that realm, particularly in the UK recently with um, nurses and um, transport and now university lectures are going on strike in a couple of, or in about a week and a half. And then obviously in the US, there have been movements to unionize you know, Starbucks and Amazon and all these sorts of things. Um, and the, this is really, really important. But at the same time, you know, unions have gone down a really weird path themselves where they, some unions, <laughs> people are going to hate me for this, but they've begun to distrust the autonomy of their own workers. Um, and this has been a massive problem. And I do think that some of the battles that we're going to see in the future will be battles that are will be difficult to recognize um, in terms of fights for higher wages, because a fight for a higher wage can almost be incorporated within capitalism, almost. Mm -hmm. um, but a, well, it can be incorporated within capitalism through like, you know, the same sorts of mechanisms that carry on, you know, automation, all the things that I was discussing um, that try to like dampen down these pressures. But a demand for autonomy over one's work, autonomy over one's life is a harder demand to avow or to give into. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, <laughs> the fact that this is, you know, you know, people really reject this. I mean, I've, I've just started a TikTok. <laughs> I've put a bunch of clips up. And I put a clip up about human reason. And I said, look, you have to believe in the ability of human beings to exercise reason, to reflect on what they hear and rationally decide how to act, um, to you know, make a choice. Doesn't mean, when I say reason, I don't mean like everyone is always right. Like you can use your reason and logic to come to the wrong conclusion. We do it all the time, but you do use it. You, do, you are reflecting, you are using logic. It's not like you know, stimulus re response, like a lab rat. Uh, mm. And people were really like, no, no, no. I mean, yes, reason, sure, we've got it, but it's not the only thing. And they're always so keen to say this. But look, reason is the basis of even our ba of our liberal democratic freedoms. It's also the basis of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is the control of society by workers. You must uh, you must have faith in people's ability to understand the world and choose how to organize it, or you can forget about all of that. <laughs> You can we're, well. We'll talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat. I, I mentioned it because it's one of the articles we wanted to discuss this week. Um, but you know, you can let go of of the basic premises of Marxism if you let that go, and we really have. Um, and I think this is reflected within some unions where it's they've really given over to safety, um, to a lot of neoliberal um, frameworks and ideas and and um, jargon and that's their main area of concern and the idea that we might be fighting for autonomy and control of our work is not always on the agenda and I think it's not on the agenda for anybody at the moment and that is a humongous gap 
in any kind of progressive movement. We don't believe in people anymore. And when people assert that I want to have freedom, we're like, ooh, ah, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know what to say. No, demand money, demand safety, demand protection, but freedom I can't give you. Well, I, you know, I definitely agree with you that we have to embrace basically fundamental uh, values from the enlightenment, right? The, the, the embrace of individual reason um, and responsibility um, and, you know, uh, fraternity um, and, and liberty. All of these things can't just be tossed aside. I mean, there's been an effort. Uh, and But I would say to say that it's an effort maybe – there has been a reaction to the problems of modernity, uh, which has included that the rejection of the Enlightenment, the, of the rejection of reason. Or the, the, of, there's been a romantic turn um, in reaction to the problems of modernity. It's been critical. The romantic turn is a kind of criticism of modernity, right? Um, and we have to uh, see the, the what's what's valid about that those romantic kind of right-wing critiques of modernity and of the principles of the enlightenment um see where what the sorts of limitations are on our ability to be uh reasonable individual subjects and then try to correct them try to move beyond those impasses and um but the the uh the, for me uh i think that we have to also recognize that simply making a cultural demand that people uh, change their attitudes or their core beliefs about uh, about their own ability to reason is is not going to be sufficient like we um we have to organize you know uh, we have to achieve that uh in a backwards way probably we have to organize around something else and then our our uh, ability to understand our own agency and reason will emerge from that kind of organizing i think mm. um uh the well, this uh, is kind of what happened with the um the russian well the bolshevik revolution or the russian revolution um where they had pravda <laughs> which started out as an arts and ideas magazine it was like that's what it was. <laughs> it had some poetry and stuff did you know that no um yeah, and uh, and then gradually became this space for trying to make sense of the present. And then, of course, as things began to ossify, it became the sort of um, the quintessential example of Big Brother. Everything is its opposite kind of thing. Um, you know, Pravda, truth. It's not nothing. Nothing true was printed in Pravda. But that was the idea that once you had this kind of organization. Um, you had a, a space where you could think through some of these problems. I feel like at the moment we have um, lots of, we're, we're living through a kind of new renaissance, not renaissance, enlightenment salon uh, era on the internet where we've, we've got a salon here at Sublation and other people have other ones um, and our patrons are attending our penny universities and perhaps out of this may come some kind of new forms of, of organization, but there will always be a back, I'm just saying really basic things right now, but um, there will always be a, a back and forth between us organizing and us trying to understand our present. But what's been missing for a very, very long time is any sense of any sense of organization. And in fact, it was, um, it was consciously uh, rejected any kind of organization because the, people knew in the past that when you had an organization, you had a clear leader, your enemies, governments um, on behalf of capitalists would search for the enemy and kill them, right? So you had, um, or uh, sorry, search for the leader or leaders and kill them. So Che Guevara, um, head of the Black Panthers. And so people were like, haha, I now have a movement that is leaderless. So you can <laughs> basically, I have done it for you. <laughs> so we're all just in disarray. Now, there are lots of reasons why leaderless movements emerge, and that wasn't the only one, obviously. Um, Bob but Saget, then, another what's leader. That? Bob Saget, another leader who got no, never mind. He he's a comedian. Never mind. <laughs> I don't know why I decided to, to say that. So uh can we I wanna... stop me going on and on and on saying basic things? I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Uh well, who knows? I'll have to consult my psychoanalyst 
to understand my unconscious motivations for bringing up Saget after you talked about Che Guerrero. Uh, okay, so, um, but I want to get back to the article that we're discussing mm -hmm. because um, the, the I guess the question is, to what extent do you think this uh, focus on identity also had uh, a anti-organizational, uh, anti, you know, ir irrational uh, component? Do, do you think that by focusing on identity politics, we were abdicating our responsibility to organize politically? Um, so did you just heard last night that the two Soviet Russian newspapers were Truth and News? And, and the ones understand. that had, <laughs> yeah, but th this is exactly what happened, obviously, in the Soviet Union. And like, I obviously, I think in any way that we want to move forward, I think we need to reckon with the failures of the Soviet. I just want to respond to that real quick. Mm -hmm. I think we need to reckon with the failures of the Soviet Union and try to understand why they were never able to overcome the law of value, why they then um, turn to kind of propaganda and attempts to control the population and so on. I, I mean, I fear this sort of thing myself. And I think if you're really serious, I mean, if you're not just like arguing with people on the internet, <laughs> you, you know, you have to reckon with the Soviet Union. I, and I'm not one of these people that thinks that the Soviet Union was just a, a, a total failure. I do think that there were some good, I do think that there were some good things within the Soviet Union. Um, on the other hand, like, it's not a, it's people like, oh, we know what to do. We've already, you know, this is, you know, we'll just follow what Lenin said. Oh, right. Okay. Well, it's now a hundred years later and we've been through that and real bad things actually did happen. Anyways. Um, so about identity, whether or not I think identity is, has been um, uh, a, a real, well, Chris Wright calls it a suicide impulse <laughs> that has gripped the left. Um, and I do, yeah, I think it has largely been a suicide impulse that has gripped the left. I can think of no better, I mean, if I were in the CIA, what would I do to ensure that no movement was ever able to do anything? I would send a bunch of people to meetings to be like, excuse me, <laughs> But you didn't talk about your identity as a white blah, blah. before you speak we need to acknowledge but excuse me and just keep interrupting the discussion so nothing ever happens now that said so i and i think it's 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 turned into a ton of infighting um people backbiting people trumping each other's identities it's it's become ridiculous that said, part of the reason why I don't like the hegemony of identity on the left is because it actually makes it more difficult now to speak seriously about some of these issues um, because you sound like a caricature. So there is misogyny. Like <laughs> there are problems with misogyny. You know, racism is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And now when you point it out, because people are pointing out racism and everything and misogyny and everything, it sounds really silly. Um, but I, you know, th 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 these are, are real things. Now, whether or not it should be the banner of a movement and whether or not we have to, um, uh, subordinate everything to that, which is what kind of happened, is a completely different question. Yeah, well, I think it's a question that's been largely answered. Um, that at least, you know, if it matters uh, how debates are won in terms of who has a better argument, if we can engage our reason to determine uh, who's won a debate. Um, then there's no question to me that the uh, class reductionists have won out, despite their hesitation to to argue full throatedly for their own position. Um, they've won out against the uh, identity gang. Um, that the, the there just is no, no at least if if you hold that socialism is uh, the political aim, then there can be no doubt that. Uh, being a class reductionist is the only path forward. And by that, I mean um, that you have to use abstractions and reduce complex questions to their core elements um, in order to understand society. And that, and then I also mean that the, the term class can describe a form of uh, production uh, and the formation of capital. Um, and, you know, that, at that at once you get to that point 
there is no comparable description from the identity side of the aisle. There just is no explanatory power behind uh, the identity, cultural, first, uh, uh, political leftists. Certainly none that has anything in common with those who would like to change the root uh, or the foundation of society. Mm -hmm. um, so... So the question becomes for those on the left, so those who are actually socialists, when will we stop fighting that battle? When will we stop having that debate and mm. have a different debate amongst those who actually are socialists? We should be able to recognize each other now. Mm. Um, and, uh, but, and, but somehow it continues to be worthwhile to engage in this debate. I mean, I can't, I can't, obviously every once in a while there are going to be strategic reasons why you're going to have to debate someone who like, uh, uh, you know, who's a Clinton supporter or some avowedly neoliberal Democrat, uh, just like you'll have to debate some right winger um, from time to time. It'll be part yeah, of Yeah, I mean, they, they force it on you too, right? Because like <laughs> they seem to be in, I don't know, positions of, I don't know, they seem to be in art, a lot of HR departments. So <laughs> fun story. Someone came to me uh, and told me that I need to decolonize my curriculum. And I was sitting there and this like blonde white British lady is holding a binder and she's like, and she's like, oh, and she's like it's really, really important that we decolonize the curriculum. And I noticed that you have a lot of, you know, you teach about the enlightenment, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I just find this really funny. What's happening here? <laughs> like, you're a British person. You're telling me like indigenous person from Canada, I need to decolonize. I need to, you're telling me what I need to teach and that you know better than I do what, what I'm going to be teaching in my classes and what's going to be helpful to decolonize for, for, for me, ostensibly. Uh, and she was holding this binder and she goes, Shuts it. Goes, okay, moving on. <laughs> Did she? she? Yeah, yeah. Let yeah, it go yeah. completely to her great credit. And I do feel bad for her because here's the thing: like, it's not like people; these people have bad intentions. It's just the thing, right? It's the going thing. As a good person, this is what you do. It's just totally unthinking, Unre uh, you know, un unreflective, not using your capacity of reason. You're just like, yeah, this is what good people do. I'm gonna jump on this bandwagon. But one thing that's so I, I won't criticize this person. And I think a lot of people who get involved in these sorts of things, they're just not thinking it the whole way through. But the ones that worry me are the ones who are like really rabid and they really come at you and they're like at your employer on social media, that sort of thing. So they will like force you into these kinds of scary positions. But you, you said something really interesting. You said we should all recognize each other now. And this is something that I have found very interesting where it's like um, uh, there's been this enormous realignment um, where for a long time, the political compass was extremely disoriented. We didn't, you know, the left wasn't recognizable as a left to the point where people were saying there's no point in using these words anymore because they have no relationship to what they used to be. And then, you know, Alex Hokely posted on Twitter something like, um, I've been noticing romantic anti-capitalism is coming up on the right now. And I, I said, I noticed this too. And it's not at all, it shouldn't actually be surprising because that's where it belongs. For a long time, it was on the left, but it actually, this is a romantic anti-capitalism. It's always been a, a right-wing conservative kind of movement. Um, it's, and you can be fooled that it is progressive if there is no liberalism, socialism, communism proper, you know, for future oriented and so on. Um, but now it's on the right. And now I feel like with identity politics, it's kind of the, the caricature that it's become has revealed itself also as its proper origins actually being on the right. I mean, this is a mm -hmm. part of the huge reaction was the fact that universalism preached by liberal socialist communists and so on um, destroyed individuality and destroyed the distinctiveness of particular groups. And in the place of universal, you know, universalism, they posited the unique spirit of the people, the Volk and the Volksgeist. Now, obviously, um, I'm talking about Herder, and Herder didn't necessarily um, expect, like, he saw himself very much as like within the impulse of the Enlightenment when he was talking about the distinctiveness of particular groups. But it was not long before this became 
um, very much a part of conservatism, the unique kind of spirit of different people. And then it became biologized into race um, and um, uh, the superiority of particular races. Um, but it, this, the letting this whole debate run its course and go to its logical conclusions has been a really useful clarifying, I don't know, development where perhaps we've come out of this. So you see the right for what it is and the right's now fully adopted identity politics um, in its biologized form, exactly what you would expect. Um, and now the left ought to experience that realignment and perhaps realize and pick up the pieces and recognize each other and recognize, you know, what our actual mission is. So um, when I started podcasting, you know, I, I started it, uh, uh, it's called Diet Soap, it's called Diet Soap again. And I, I reached out to podcasters who were talking about the issues that I was interested in around 2009. Um, and they were almost uniformly on the romantic right because it was like people who are interested in psychedelic alternative lifestyles, uh, uh, you know, kitchen gardens, ur urban foraging um, and so on. And uh, but the main thing that I was trying to do is say, oh, you have the psychedelic vision. You want a different kind of reality. You want a different kind of uh, basis for your life. How about? marxism like how about <laughs> how about you actually change the foundation of society rather than try to you know explore these internal spaces so that you feel the right way and uh you know and then we'll we'll have a better life that way um and and i was engaging with people who i thought of as just utopian you know but i as i engage i realized oh no these are entrenched reactionary views that have kind of an association with 60s hippie uh, romanticism, but they're actually deeply right wing. And um, and it was and as I progressed along interviewing different kinds of people and realizing I was interested in talking about critical theory and philosophy again, um, those those people fell away for the most part. I didn't engage with them anymore. Um, became more and more clear that they were not uh, ever going to sign up for something called socialism. Um, so, and I just think we can see that again now in, with the, but the, you know, and a good portion of those people are going to be Democrats. Um, and, you know, so be it. Um, but, but to, so I wanted to say, Oh yeah, I know we wanted to get back to the essay and we are kind of, we are, we are on top. Right? We maybe just cover, we'll just probably just cover the one essay. We'll have to come back to the, uh, to the to the dictatorship of the proletariat and 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 I think you've been talking about your own essay secretly all throughout the this so but anyhow I'm a one trick pony okay so someone wrote I bet there's a department of the CAA coming up with disrupt disruptive and distracting id poll BS for the left to have to deal with I actually can guarantee it and um at least Russia was doing this definitely um did you read that report about all of their fake NGOs that they had set up it's, no. it's it's absolutely astounding and extremely entertaining. So there was a huge investigation into all of these fake accounts all over the internet. And I noticed these bots were so weird. Um, and this is what caused me to look into it, where this person came at me on um, Twitter and was like, um, you know, you might be indigenous, but you're white passing. So you actually have um, a lot of privilege. And I was like, Okay, whatever. Um, and then a few weeks later, this same account wrote the exact same message to me. And I went, oh my God, it's a bot. Like, what the hell? Isn't that weird? Like literally copy and paste. So I went to the person's tweets and that's what it was. It was a bot. And I was like, and they were, well, well, now, were they sending the, that same message out just to? No. So it's, when I say a bot, it was a human. Um, but... Um, the way that it works, so this is what got me to look into this. I was like, somebody is obvious, there's something funny going on here. There's something, yeah. And you can see this too on every time the president tweets. There are a bunch of <laughs> identical tweets that come up from like a bunch of different accounts. You're like, who is doing this? This is weird. Anyway, so there was this huge investigation and they found that what the Russians were doing was they were setting up all these fake NGOs and hiring American young people sometimes, but not always, 
um, who thought that they were actually involved in something good <laughs> um, to go and create all of these accounts that were like black beauty and all of these like really devices, divisive anti um, identity politics accounts that were getting tens of thousands, some of them were getting tens of thousands of followers. Mm. Um, and they were just tweeting all day long, all of this identity politics stuff. And the people thought that they were part of an NGO and part of like the social media wing, but they'd been hired by Russia to do it. So I can well, it's not a bot, it was a content farm. Yeah, okay, sorry, it was a content farm. Yeah. Although, because that was the exact same message, it was very specific to me. And I just can't understand why it was copied and pasted. <laughs> when I say it was a bot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I Look, I'm not down with the lingo the kids these days. Right, right, bot, human, who can tell the difference? We're all living in Philip K. Dick's world. Um, but so, but the point is that this was some, this was a, an account that had someone had paid for, you think, to, uh, direct these kinds of tweets and it was in working conjunction with other Twitter accounts like it. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure like, there's more to this that goes on. So there, like, there are bots in the actual sense of bots. <laughs> It's all the same to me, but um, that are they have pre-made messages that they're posting from a million different accounts on all all across social media platforms. Like this stuff is going on, and who is behind it is really really interesting. Um, mm. They're just trying to like so um, disarray and discord, um, mm. and they don't care where. Um, like um, the Russians were doing, were playing both the left and the right, so they were ratcheting it up on both sides, just to create turmoil in people's lives. And weaken the U.S. population. Or I don't what, know I mean, what the goal was. Obviously, we only know what they actually did. But I find it really funny that um, the people who were involved in it. You can go and read the report. It's been a long time since I've I've um, read it, um, and perhaps I'm mangling some of the details. But um, certainly, the people who were a lot of people who were involved in it had no idea, and they, they thought they were doing good. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Send me that report because maybe we can talk about it next week. I hmm. um. I'm not much on Twitter these days. I, I, you know, I, I, when I was at zero, I built up a pretty substantial, not huge, but like 20,000 Twitter followers or something. And right now I've, I'm just under 8,000 with my own personal account. And I haven't been tweeting very much. And um, what happened was, you know, I tweeted about Dave Chappelle and got, got brigaded. Um, and, and then ever since then, I've just been playing it super safe and of course not getting any, followers so i'm, I'm going to get back on twitter i'm going to say what i actually mean i'm i'm looking to get canceled again it's been too long i need the attention i need the attention i i, I can't go much longer without that uh, well this is the other thing too is that now of course cancellation can be very lucrative like not if you're a nobody like not if you're just you know a normal human being going about your life and you get caught up in this stuff and you have no idea what the heck is going on no that's quite bad um, but I, I always use the anecdote of I was at a conference once and uh, actually it was a debate um, between like this very right wing kind of person. And I heard his assistant say to him, look, I've been telling you, you need to get canceled because <laughs> that's that was that would be the pathway to fame. Uh, and that's it. That's basically someone says the attention economy go burr. Yeah, that's, yeah, know, that's yeah, it. yeah, that's exactly it. And it's and the question is, how the heck do we do we get through this? Um, but I'll tell you one way that we don't get through it. And one of the uh, really interesting points. Someone says you can't get canceled right now. Twitter's on fire. Yeah, all the, this <laughs> is something else to realize is that the old social media ecosystem, I think, has is self-destructing. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, everything's being turned into TikTok. So can mm. you get canceled on TikTok? I don't even think you can. Um, well, I went on. I The first video that I put on TikTok was... Um, that Marxism video <laughs> where I right. tried to explain to a Sky News producer in the simplest language I possibly could um, that communism, oh, what was it? That um, that Marxism is not about utterly destroying uh, capitalism, but rather capitalism creates communism every day. Um, and it's about the fact that capitalism puts limits on our ability to progress and we must bust forth. We must burst those limits. Um, that's, that was my thing, but I tried to say it really, really clearly. And boy, TikTok did not like that. <laughs> but it, did it get a lot of views, though? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
well, I can't remember, but almost a hundred thousand, I think that one. Yeah. Um, and, but there were a lot of people like who just, I mean, it's a really, really common thing that people who think people think that if we don't say capitalism is bad, harshly enough and strong enough and frequently enough, people will just never revolt. Uh, and the thing is that that people will just look around and be like, yeah, but it's lifted millions of people out of poverty and like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you have to be realistic. Like it is true. It is true. The problem is that capitalism also destroys the good things that it creates. Um, and that, you know, we, it, this destruction that we're seeing right now is completely unnecessary. Um, people, I was, I've been watching the news lately and I'm so annoyed where people are like, yep, we're going to have to tighten our belts. We're all going to have to tighten our belts. We're going to have to learn to live with less. Why? Uh, have we forgotten how to make things? Um, was there a famine? Um, it, you know, no, it's, it's completely made up. We still are able to make enormous amounts of stuff to consume. We can make people's lives immensely better materially. We can give people an enormous amount of freedom. We can do that with the ability and the tech abilities and technologies that we have today. And it is capitalism that is holding that back. It is yeah. holding us back and, and it's going to destroy a heck of a lot of the great things that it creates if we do not figure out how the heck to control it. I, I completely agree. Let's answer viewer mail now. Um, yes. And I, I've got the Henry Mancini uh, song playing in my head, but I won't play it on the YouTube channel. So I, we do not get a copyright uh, violation or whatever. But uh, yeah, just pretend everyone that you heard the viewer mail theme from 1988. I, I know you all know it. Um, no. So, uh, <laughs> Even I don't. No, and I, I know. And I know. Old. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, so... Yeah. Um, so please ask us your questions in the chat, but I will also be um, bringing up some uh, questions that we've got on Patreon that have been sent to us on via email or that have come up on YouTube. And um, so we'll be going back and forth between these. So um, someone in the uh, Sublation Patreon says, uh, so Doug announced that we are doing monthly pamphlets and mm -hmm. someone suggests that we should do box sets by mail. Tell us in the comments down below if you would find that interesting. And Doug, what do you think about sending out box sets of pamphlets by mail so that people can actually hold our beautifully designed pamphlets in their hands? Well, put them on um, their coffee tables. The, the, the pamphlets yep. will be, you know, paper printed on paper and, and mailed out. And when we have published a number of them, we very well may release box sets that people can purchase whether or not it will be a benefit from being a patron or if you have to purchase that uh, from our site whether or not it might be made for sale through ordinary vendors um like barnes and noble I'm, I'm not sure but um i do think a box set would be a nice thing and and the nice thing about having a little box set uh is that you can even print the pamphlets uh with paper covers which we're playing, you know, we're not sure if it's going to be cardboard or paper covers for the pamphlets. But if if we were aiming to have these box sets available, those last. I I have uh, recently I went to Brooklyn and w w was staying in uh, the uh, of, of the apartment of, of my girlfriend's parents, and her uh, deceased father had these box sets of pamphlets, um, and they were from like the. 70s 80s and they were in really good condition so it is a worthwhile thing to to consider and to do i think when we've printed enough we will do that and it also fits into what i was saying before that we're living through a, a period of um enlightenment <laughs> like in the new kind of salon because that is exactly what the salons uh did well well not the salons but that's exactly what happened during the enlightenment was pamphleteering was a very big thing okay so someone asked in the chat how do you negotiate distribution after capitalism? I know that was a big jump thematically, but I felt like I wanted to answer that before it goes up. So here's the thing. We've never actually sorted this out. Someone in the chat suggested, oh, we have um, uh, planning boards of workers and so on. And, you know, you can think about the NHS when it was first developed before you hired a million managers and introduced internal markets and all that crap. Um, you know, you had um, a few people, <laughs> representatives from different uh, interest groups that sat on a board. 
you know, that kind of thing. Um, it could be something like um, how a library works now where you manage supply and demand by what's available and people like check things, check things out. I don't know, but these are one of the, these, I, this is one of the big questions that we need to figure out. Um, now, obviously we don't want blueprints for the future, but I do think it is worthwhile to look at some uh, technologies that already exist and that are begging to be freed. Um, um, like one interesting kind of social experiment at the moment is Bitcoin where it's taken the contradiction of money to its logical conclusion. Let's uh, let's entirely untether money from labor and see what happens. Predictably, disaster. But what would happen if we took it the other way? These are the kinds of social experiments that need to happen, I think. And maybe we could start with thought experiments and move on from that. I don't know if Doug has anything to add. Um, no, not, not really. The, the question of distribution is one which has to be worked out. I think um, abolishing labor and that means abolishing uh, value, abstract value, or labor, abstract labor, um, as a mediating force in society, will lead to, if we replace it, you know, if we have some other mediating uh, aim of production, that will dictate to the realm of distribution. That will set up how we distribute what we produce. Um, but yeah, labor credits. We, you know, I recently did a a, a um, uh, podcast with um, uh, Conrad Hamilton on labor credits on the um, uh, yeah labor credits suck um, uh, on the critique of the Gotha program and I wish it had gone a little differently than it did if we had, in other words that we had been more meticulous in talking about the critique of the Gotha program itself um, because I I think that it's worth examining just what Marx is proposing when he talks about labor credits and the critique of the Gotha program. Um, and I should make a video about that sometime. I think I will. Uh, now going back to, we were going to have it. So I went to the to the chat, and you were going to read the questions. I'm going to switch around. Um, this is some questions from uh, the podcast that I did with uh, Ron and Ursula from uh, the News and Letters, which is a Marxist humanist organization. Um, I'm not sure who in Ukraine are the guests are talking to, and maybe I'm extremely jaded. This is a comment about that podcast. But if Ukraine is able to drive out the Russian forces, I'm pretty sure the next group that will be put against the wall are the leftists giving Ursula and Ron such hope. It seems like the best way to support these folks is to press for an immediate ceasefire in the war as soon as possible and preserve what few political rights these folks still have. NATO has a history of brutally repressing leftist movements, so not sure how liberating it's going to be uh, good for the, the left in Ukraine in the end. That said, this is a great discussion on both sides. Thank you, Doug. There's some summation of differences in the particular, but agreement in the aggregate, or however you put it, was spot on. Felt the same. And if Ron and Ursula can put you in touch with some of these Ukrainian leftists that they seem to be in touch with, I'd be very interested in hearing their story. Yeah, it'd be worthwhile to um, to in interview some people in Ukraine, but I'm not sure how feasible or practical that that would be at the moment. I don't. I, I really don't know. Probably. Some Ukrainian refugees might be available for interviews, uh, leftist refugees. Um, I will say one thing about this, which is uh, I was in, again, I was in Brooklyn recently, and I, I had lunch with Norman Finkelstein, um, whose book, uh, I'll Burn That Bridge when, we, when I Get to It, is coming out soon, hopefully in December, possibly in January, um, from Sublation Press. And... I was talking to him about Ukraine, and he said he worried about the po potential for a nuclear Armageddon, not now, but after uh, a Ukraine victory uh, in the war, that um, Ukraine, he said, will have real trouble controlling its right-wing militia groups along the border, and that after uh, new borders are drawn and there's some peaceful negotiation, it will be very difficult to stop the conflict from continuing to escalate, um, especially now that those really Nazi militia groups have been armed to the teeth by NATO. Uh, so the potential for uh, uh, fighting to erupt that's not being directed um, by Zelensky or, or NATO, but just as provocative and could end up with uh, a massive, let's say a massive 
bombing of Ru some Russian city, uh, you know, that could he, he thought that could spark World War Three. So the situation in Ukraine is fraught with peril, and there are no really great solutions. But I still believe that peaceful negotiation is better than continued uh, escalation of the war, even despite the fact that Ukraine seems to be doing well at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I wanted to say that that whole discussion was really, really polarizing, where there were some people who thought that, you know, it was, it was really useful. And some people thought that uh, Ron and Ursula were just delusional. <laughs> um, and I think this is that's quite characteristic of this particular discussion, um, where it's, I have I don't think anything in recent time has has really pulled out so much vitriol in people where no matter what position you take, people will say like, you know, you're, you, you know, you're sucking Putin's <laughs> versus like, you know, like really, really nuts. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I guess that's just part for the course when it comes to international conflict, but it's been, it's not, it's not something that we've necessarily seen for a very, very long time. And it's quite jarring. I am. Um, I think we should go on and ask you a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um but we're we're scheduled to start the parrot room um in about 10 minutes um i can reschedule it for a little further out and if we want to take another five minutes now yeah let's take uh, another five minutes to answer a few more questions i there was a, a little bit of a, a debate within our chat about um the idea of labor chits um and i think i think that's a good point to sort of reiterate that at sublation we are not um, a kind of um, political grouping that ha we're quite open about. This is a project for us trying to understand the present and make and make our way through the disarray. We don't sort of advocate a particular path, at least not yet. <laughs> um, uh, and we are more about educating and open and opening up areas where we think there isn't enough debate. Um, that, and so that said, if you don't agree with me about labor certificates, then you will be sent to Gulag after the revolution. But otherwise, we're very open. <laughs> but like, I mean, that's the thing is that I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting sort of um, social development that we have experimented with the complete opposite of labor chits. Um, and that has ended predictably. Um, and perhaps we should experiment with labor chits. I don't know. You also have to read the Grindrisa to, <laughs> to find out why. In what one you case can do on your own, but also with sublation, we are running our Grindrisa uh, discussion group once a month. I need mm -hmm. to be uh, setting the next date. We had about five people in the last discussion group. Um, it was recorded. I have the, the MP4 file. I will be releasing it. Um, I think I might release it to everyone who's a patron uh, in the next couple, maybe in the next week or so. I find a time just to post it on our uh, patron feed. So if you sign up to be a patron you can listen to the last discussion group we were talking about the first notebook on money and it is relevant to both crypto and to the question of recession today so, exactly um, and you will see that the main difference is when marx critiques the suggestion of labor money it's within capitalism it cannot abolish the contradictions of money within capitalism that's the difference mm -hmm. um so perhaps there's no point then in experimenting <laughs> Um, so someone says, hey, Doug and Ashley, an update on the pamphlet front. The first one has been designed. I like the suggestion of the box set perhaps annually, a dirty dozen from the filthy left. So there's something now, to look forward that's to. That's Gilbert May, and he is the um, uh, publisher in New Zealand who uh, came to me and suggested that we make these pamphlets. He's designing the uh, interior and the covers for us. Uh, we have a you know an agreement where he's going to sell them in, the, in New Zealand to bookstores. We're going to distribute them here. Um, he's very generous in his terms. He's a good leftist comrade. Um, and thank you, Gilbert, for everything that you're doing. I will be sending you the copy for the back of the, uh, the first issue of the pamphlet today, Gilbert. Um, uh, I need to write the ad copy that we're going to put at the back. Like, if you like this pamphlet, then click on the subscribe button. I think is what it's going to say. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Paper, paper medium. But, but anyway, when my daughter tells stories to her her sister, she says the end. If you would like more of these stories, subscribe to my channel. <laughs> <laughs> I have failed as a parent. No, no, no. You you succeeded. She's she'll be able to operate in the new world. 
Yeah, um, I'll have her on the, the the stream soon. So, okay, uh, someone says on the on the stunt stream. So the Halloween stunt stream, um, that was really popular. I got a lot of um, really great comments by email, Patreon, and YouTube um, that uh, people really liked the conversation between me and Conrad Hamilton. And I got about equal um, criticism and praise for my shit show with Buent, mm -hmm. where I could not control myself and that was, I did a terrible job. Um, but uh, I hope that it was kind of, okay. I'm also my own worst critic, so let me I say. I don't think you did a terrible job at all. I think that I set up a conflict that I should have seen, I should have prepped Buoyant on more thoroughly or at all. Uh, and, you know, and I, I just set that going and then realized, oh yeah, you needed to set some guardrails in place before you set these two at each other. So I had to come back in to kind of set up the guardrails, but um, it was real and it was, uh, I think it was worth having it out. Um, and there's always this contradiction where you're, we're publishing people we don't agree with. Right. I mean, I don't know to what degree the disagreement, I don't know how, how deep the disagreement with brilliant. So my really runs um, it's sort of similar to, the disagreement I have with Ron and Ursula, like there's a lot of shared core kind of theoretical agreement, mm -hmm. but then when it comes to practical decisions or the kind of policy suggestions and things like that that come out, we very, we disagree. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, it's tricky. You're publishing someone whose book you don't necessarily agree with, but who you think is contributing to the conversation in a way that yeah. can be helpful. Um, and I think that conversation was helpful. So I'm anyway, I'm going on and on. I'll let you talk. No, but, you can uh, pick the next question. Okay, I'll pick the next question. Should I go for the chat or um uh let's see. Someone says, yeah, yeah, Doug planted the bomb. All right, that's exactly <laughs> right. Um I do need to learn so how to When will Sublation's media announce the People's Republic of Cascadia? And are we going to implement municipal marijuana? Um well, this is on a serious kind of, uh, question. Um, but uh uh, I, I will announce the People's Republic of Cascadia just as soon as JREG and I get it together to, to launch a political movement uh, for that. We will build a wall between uh, Cascadia and the rest of the United States. Um, and uh, not only will marijuana be legal within Cascadia, but everyone will be required to smoke at least one joint. Per day. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's my answer to that. Well, that's that's very useful because I was just talking today about the difference between tolerating something and thinking it should be mandatory, which we have lost, Doug. Thanks. <laughs> I think it should be mandatory. We can debate that. So a point of disagreement between us, even though I don't do it myself. It would be and mandatory for everybody else. Um, all right. So a couple more questions from the someone uh, asked um how did doug uh, someone asked on the patreon how did doug become friends with a trump supporter oh right um well he reached out to me through facebook um he told me he was the smartest man i'd ever talked to um and that I, he really wanted to help me understand the world um and you know i debated him on facebook you know sort of and then i decided I would bring him on um, and, and it was around the time of the 2020 election when it was still up in the air who was going to win and there was a you know Trump was insisting that the uh, the vote had been rigged and it was a very heated time and I thought it would be worthwhile to like humanize a, a Trumpist to like, so I brought him on just to have a conversation to show that his concerns weren't really that alien um, from every from from the left's concerns, even that he was basically like everybody else, a kind of a libertarian, um, and uh, uh, you know, concerned for having a successful bourgeois republic, um, despite the fact that he would go off, I think, into crazy territory from time to time. And we made a bet: if if Biden actually became president. I would have won the bet, and if Trump got back into the White House, he would have won the the the, the, the bet. And I won the bet, and he came on the channel and admitted that I had won and that he had been deluded, um, and, and then went on to say a bunch more delusional things. But um, I realized I really liked Stephen when he emailed me or messaged me to say, 
Doug, don't get the booster. They're trying to kill you. And uh, I thought, oh, he cares. He, <laughs> even though I'm a Marxist, <laughs> he doesn't want me. I, 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 to I, I was touched by that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Do you know, there's like a trend online where it's like my toxic trait is, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's cheesy, but my toxic trait definitely is trying to convince people who otherwise hate everything I stand for. <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah i kind I, of I with do you think on these that. have been my most fruitful conversations for real yeah and and i feel like we became friends over the course of that uh of the, the all those exchanges and even though you know i i know i'm never going to really change his mind and make him into a good commie and he knows he's never going to make me into well you know whatever he's invented last week is um we are i think we are actually friends uh, so there you have it well what a what nice way to talk about your friend <laughs> <laughs> well this is how i talk about my friends this is true, exactly how is i talk true. about my friends that's true if i love you that's when i you know that i love you when i insult you and we are on an <laughs> relationship you right, know, right. if, if mm. i'm nice to you so, <laughs> okay so i think let's let's just do one one more quick question um Oh, uh, Dialectics1917 um, on the Patreon became very annoyed with your combative style in Fatal Parents. Uh, parents. Fatal Parents. Uh, did you read that one? I hope you didn't. Um, oh, uh, I don't. Yeah, let's read it now. What did they say? Oh, I, I meant right now. Uh, I am a long time and avid listener of your podcast and its many iterations. Me too. <laughs> but I found myself increasingly frustrated with the combative and at times hostile approach you take to guests who differ from you on matters of theory. Oh, yes, I did. I remember this. Yes. Uh, it seems at times that you insist on being nitpicky and pedantic simply if they do not align themselves perfectly with your hyper rationalist reading of Marx. Baudrillard is one of the most insightful theorists of the post-war era who radicalized many of Marx's concepts to apply to this new period of consumer capitalism. He began as a communist and then later abandoned Marxism, much because of the pitfalls and missteps of the PCF. But the analysis of value and thus capital always remained central for him. There's so much to learn. Perhaps if you were to have read more of him and in so doing apply a bit of self-criticism, you would have been more charitable to Susanna as a guest. Defend yourself, Doug. Well, I was simply negging her. I, I, you know, I, uh, I was, this was a setup for the fatal date. So, you know, I was, uh, was trying to neg Susanna in an, uh, an attempt to create some sort of flirtation in that uh, podcast. But, uh, but that's not how you flirt. Are you you don't know, you know, you have to, you have to watch it for yourself, but, um, no, in seriousness, um, uh, I have read some Boudiard and I've read, I read him in the nineties and I read him after I read Marx. And I think that his, the book that he wrote in directly in response to Marx demonstrates a failure to take up and understand Marx's basic categories. And so I do not think that Baudillard is a good critic of Marx. Um, he may have some cultural observations that, uh, are worth, uh, considering. Um, but, he uh, uh is is I, I i my hope is that as susanna continues to explore the ideas of Baudillard and i continue to edit those explorations that my little montage sequences uh which will be critical will seep in and maybe shift her away from Baudillard and uh, to, into reading hegel um so that's <laughs> that's my response to that but so basically, I, I hear you and I reject everything you're saying, uh, patron. <laughs> but but um, but I will actually I will be forced to return to reading Baudillard and 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 trying to take him seriously because I think the best way to um, criticize someone and to undermine them is to take them absolutely seriously and mm -hmm. pay very close attention to their arguments. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I I was not really nagging her. Um, consciously i'm gonna now deny everything i just said okay is there should we should we wrap it up here let's move on to the patreon where we can talk about um more about the magazine um we'll be talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat and the future and how to get there so join yeah, okay. us in about yeah, 10 minutes good. five minutes that, five minutes yeah that, yeah five minutes or, five let minutes. me get another cup of coffee so 10 minutes let's say okay. and uh, uh we'll we'll see you we'll see you there in the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people
moving around potential targets such as military bases and 